Why are divorce rates so high? Is capital a safer store of value than sound money? And can we accurately model the climate's future? We'll discuss these questions and more on today's episode of Good Take, Bad Take. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of the Good Take, Bad Take podcast. This is the show where Donnie and I go through our social media feeds. We find takes and we critique or praise them. Uh, Like I said, I'm here with my co-host Donnie and we're going to do that today. Uh, Before we get started, make sure to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. It helps us out a lot. You can find us on Good Take, Bad Take pod on Instagram and Good Bad Take pod on Twitter and YouTube. Without further ado, let's get into the first of these takes. So Zuby on Twitter writes... I absolutely hate divorce and how common and normalized it is in Western society. I'd say you and I both probably agree with that. Uh, And then someone added to the conversation writing, "Mm, hate the origin, hate the fact that marriage, especially in young people, is pushed far too early and people don't have a chance to realize that your first or second serious relationship might not be the person you spend your whole life with. The teaching is, instead... After you've picked someone, just deal with whatever they throw at you and always try to fix it just to avoid divorce. Divorce rates are higher because a lot more people are realizing they're unhappy. Fix the entire messaging around it and we fix the issue. We're critiquing the uh, the person that added to the conversation. What do you think about their their angle on this? Uh, I think it's unfortunately misinformed. Um, it, it's one of those things where, yeah, you you should hate the underlying issue of divorce as well, but that doesn't stop the fact that divorce as the way uh, as a tool that has been used i would say by the culture that is also something to lament the the act in and of itself in you know should be if if you have sort of this divorce uh, system set up it shouldn't be something celebrated or it should be a lamentable thing in the same way that you know you might lament any kind of difficult thing in the same way that we shouldn't celebrate um having to shoot someone in self-defense right like that's you shouldn't celebrate the fact that i got to shoot this guy who was attacking me but in the you know the, the act itself should be seen as tragic but the other thing is the fact that his prescription of what is causing these divorces is completely wrong as well. When you've incentivized and rewarded divorce, when you've given no fault divorce its place and you've told an entire generation that life is about yourself, it's about what you want to do, it's this is empowering to women, whatever the, the cultural lies were being told about this, then of course it's going to have the uptick. It's going to be picked up. So yeah, there are cases where maybe people were pushed into relationships too young. That's not the underlying cause of why divorce rates are high or what what should be lamented. The the idea of young marriage, that's not a wrong thing if it's done in a respectful and, and, and correct way. But the fact that we have a culture that has divorce as an option means that you're also placing less emphasis for those decisions to be made wisely. Now, I get that younger people tend to be less rational, let you know, a little bit more on the spur of things. And so that could be a reason why they would get married. But if if the cultural cost is like, you, you know, you don't have a no-fault divorce, that does that does give emphasis and incentive for people to think, well, I need to make sure that I'm doing this wisely and investing. So that's one reason right there that already disrupts one of his main one of one of the points he lists there, which is like, oh, it's just because people get married too young. Well, people probably wouldn't get married too young if the institution of divorce as it is currently accepted in our culture didn't exist. Uh, Again, not saying that there's no circumstances in which you can't separate people. Uh, I tend to think there are biblical prescriptions for that that are narrow, limited, and have faults involved, right? So the no-fault divorce thing is the big problem here. Um, And so if you eliminated the idea of no-fault divorce, you already cut back on one one of these underlying causes that he says you should hate. Guess what? That underlying cause, one of the ways to help solve that is by getting rid of the tool that makes it a mistake that's really easy to scrub out. Yeah, like, like one, I'm happy. Obviously, this person agrees that divor- like divorce being a common thing is a bad, bad thing. Right. Like that, that's that's a good deal. But the the prescription and the diagnosis this person gives uh, for that diagnosis is, is completely wrong. It's it's like saying like, oh yeah, like obesity is bad, but what we should really be worried about is you know, the fact that a person that's obese gets more heart disease or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, that's an that's an aspect of it. And if we change the messaging around that and just say, hey, don't become obese because uh, you're going to have heart disease or something like that, like that doesn't take into the totality of why people become obese in the first place, which is we have a completely bad messaging around uh, self-indulgence. And 
in the very same way with with marriage, like we look at it and this person talks about it, that marriage is supposed to be something that makes you happy. And I think what gives the game away on this is uh, divorce rates are higher because a lot more people are realizing they're unhappy. And it's like, you know, in marriage, like the whole purpose of it is not to just make you happy. Like, yes, happiness is an aspect of it, but there are frequently going to be times within marriage, long stretches potentially, where you will be unhappy. Some of the best marriage advice that I ever got from, from one of my mentors who he's now been married almost 50 years, a long time. He literally told me, he's like, you're going to have good decades and bad decades. Uh, and at that period of time, I'd only been alive two decades at all. So I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy, man. Uh, you know, decades where you carry 99% and your your spouse carries 1% and vice versa. And so we, it's not just that our, you know, like he, he prescribes that it's like, hey, like people just need to not realize that they're unhappy. Like they just need to be happy in marriage. It's like, no, like marriage, it's a completely different paradigm, right? Like marriage is for the purpose of creating families, right? It's a, it's a bar. It's a, it's an agreement between two people to bring children and people into this world and to be totally and completely 100% faithful to each other, no matter what occurs, regardless of whether you are happy or not. And like you're saying, like there are biblical from our framework, and, and I think even in, from a secular framework, uh, reasons that like you could break that contract because one of the other side of the party has broken that contract in a way that is, you know, violent or, or destructive. Uh, but like the entire messaging around marriage, and I agree that it is a messaging issue, is not that it's like, oh, like, don't get married young or anything like that. It's that all the incentives are in the wrong place and that our culture has prized selfishness and happiness above duty and honor and selflessness in the first place. Uh, and until we actually reckon with that and we realize that marriage is not, like, it's not something that is supposed to be, uh, you know, self-fulfilling and self-actualizing and all these different things and that, oh, I'm being prepared for someone and someone's being prepared for me and we're going to have this romanticized whatever, uh, we are going to continue to have these issues and we're going to, we should be asking the question, how do we get to the point in society where we have no fault divorce as opposed to like, well, if we just got rid of no fault divorce, like we'd be better, right? Like we, we live in a society where we got to that point, whatever caused that point is what we actually should be addressing. Um, and so, yeah, this person's like on our team in a way, but they've, they're kind of going at it from the wrong angle, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. The, the, it feels like this person is already seeing things from the perspective that the that the culture has sold right the idea that you are entitled to certain expectations of what a rela relationship should look like and and that's you know kind of the you know he, he's right to say for instance you know your your first or second serious relationship might not be the right person you spend your whole life with but then um but then he says the idea that it's like after that you pick someone to and you try to avoid whatever they throw at you and it's like that's not that's not really right. <laughs> you know, like you pick someone and then you love them because that's what love is. Love is sacrifice. It's not avoiding what they throw at you. It's taking what they throw at you because you love them and sacrifice for them. And so just the, the very fact that he, he says, yeah, look, people just don't even get it. Relationships just because it's a serious one time doesn't mean that you're going to get with them forever. That's re ridiculous. Disney nonsense. Also, once you get married, it's all downhill and it's all about yeah. avoiding blows and stuff. It's like, you can, you also kind of believe a cartoon version of, of what goes on there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think he, again, probably the right, um, the right, a noble attempt, but not the right understanding. And I think it's probably more again from, from buying sort of the epistemology of what your what we've grown up with in in many cases not um with yeah. an actual biblical what i think would be the truth or at least just healthy understanding of of marriage and relationships when um, that works right and, yeah and exactly. pragmatic in in a way and you know people will say like they'll hear my description of what marriage is like oh it's not meant to make you happy you know it's meant for you to you know one be faithful to this person to bring children into this world They're like well that's just so unromantic or whatever but uh are you have you read much of like tim keller um, a, a little bit of his stuff, yeah. I, I've he liked, kind of, uh, unfortunately, uh, may he rest in peace, but he, uh, unfortunately, of his life was a little bit not as good on certain things. But he has this really amazing book called The Meaning of Marriage. And uh, in it, he writes, you know, a, a healthy marriage is, is not about being happy. It's about, you know, who the other person, loving who the other person is becoming, to will the good for the other person, as uh, Thomas Aquinas would say, yeah. what love actually is. And um and he kind of, he has this kind of analogy. He's like, you know, we don't actually know, you know, when we die, whether we'll know each other in heaven or whatever. But uh, if you're if you're two Christians and you're married and you die and you get to heaven, 
you know, there's this beautiful moment, potentially, if you do know each other, that you can look at the other person and be like, man, like now I see you for what I always imagined you could be, right? Like a true yeah. Christian marriage would be able to look across and be like, you know, I, I knew throughout our whole marriage, whether we were married five years or 80 years, like I knew what you could become because I know that you know Jesus. Uh, and now I get to see it in whole. And yeah. that's what that's what a truly good marriage is. Like how how romantic is that to to know, to choose someone, regardless of whether it makes you happy or unhappy, and then to will the good for them their entire lives and believe that they can become something that they are fully meant to be, to become that, you know, as a Christian, you know, fully like Christ. Like that, that regardless of circumstance, regardless of in health or wealth or sickness or whatever, like to believe that. And uh, that is the type of, you know, fortitude and belief that not only is romantic, but but leads to a marriage that can last uh, for a very long time. And that inevitably and, and, and ironically actually remains happy even in the most of dire circumstances. Yeah, the, the last thing I will say is I think that one way you can sort of talk to this point about marriage isn't really about happiness. Um, although I, I, will, I will agree with you that oftentimes the healthiest marriages are the ones that do lead to happiness. Yeah. Uh, but but I would also say probably more joy than happiness, right? Joy. There is a distinction yes. there. And the happiness is more temporary fleeting. Joy is this underpinning, almost like state of being uh, in a sense. Uh, but it, but happiness is also a choice in, in, many, in many cases. But, but to, to underscore this, let's say that you have a couple, they get married and uh, like three years in after they're married, um, the wife gets into a horrible car accident and is maimed she's alive but she's quadriplegic and cannot speak very well i think almost every person would get a an internal gut feeling if that man then divorced her right you would you would get that that cognitive and and moral dissonant feeling of like oh that's not right but but recognize that if he doesn't divorce her He's going to live in a marriage that is very unhappy at times because he's going to be wholly serving her. He's going to get very little of the service back in the sense of like, she's not going to be able to go to the store for him to get, to get groceries. They're not going to be able to go out and, and do normal couple things. Like all of the sort of um, material joys of a marriage are taken away. And yet we still recognize that in that situation, it would be morally reprehensible for him to divorce her and then go marry someone else because he wants to have, you know, like sex, right? Like that would be seen as a despicable thing to do. And, and the question is why? Because if marriage is about divorce or if marriage is about divorce, if marriage is about happiness, then all you would have to do to justify is say, well, he's not, you know, she's not going to be happy either way. And he at least is going to be the happy one if, if they split and divorce. And he's going to at least get a, get a relationship that works for him. Um, and so, in this case, you know, you just have to fix the underlying reason why he's not happy, which is he can't do any of the normal couple things. And then, you know, you'll get rid of divorce in another way. But th but this is the underlying issue here. It's not that divorce is the problem in this case, which, of course, is an absurd thing to say. And we recognize that it is a tragedy and that there will be lots of unhappy moments. But the right thing and the loving thing and true love is service above yourself in that really, really tragic situation. Uh, and so I don't think I don't think when it comes down to it, people like this actually even believe what they think they believe. I think if you put that position to him, I think you'd probably recognize, oh yeah, no, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes. All right, moving on to our next one. Uh, we've got a Twitter user, Mike Brock, and he writes, arguing that money should, by some objective measure, be a safer store of wealth than capital itself is moralistic nonsense. To the extent that everyone thinks we can replace the function of capital markets as a superior savings vehicle, you know, things with income bearing assets behind them with fixed supply money is just complete nonsense. Obviously, I'm going to have to write my own Bitcoin book now. I don't really have a choice. What do you think? I, I think this is a good take. I, I'm a little bit less um, technically versed in in a lot of the the finance world and stuff but and so the way that he puts it is a little bit foreign to me but it makes it makes sense in that to me and maybe i'm misreading this so maybe you can correct me but it seems like you know in sort of layman's terms what he's saying is the idea that money is a better indicator of value is ridiculous a better indicator of value than things that actually produce like a machine a business factory a, a successful business in general whatever um and that we have to you know, regulate everything, and we have to um, put all of our value into this this currency that 
you know, has like a fixed supply or, or that's manipulated. Like the idea that that's somehow better than the things that actually produce value is a ridiculous idea. And then kind of implies that's why Bitcoin is valuable is because it can't be manipulated and is a probably a better store of value. Unless I'm, unless I'm mistaken, uh, that's kind I'm, of the, I'm not sure on his Bitcoin point. So I, it's interesting. My general sense of this, and I'm glad you said it was a good take. Cause I think it's kind of a bad take in some ways, okay. or at least okay. an interesting one, like an interesting with a bad slant. Uh, and the reason it has a bad slant is because money should, by some objective measure. And I think he's coming after folks that are like adv advocating for sound money. Um, and so, so like if we have, let's just say in, in the current system we have, this is a good take. Like he's, he's incredibly correct. Like because a capital asset, when we print money and we devalue currency, is the only way for you to actually maintain any sort of value. But in an economy that has sound money, it's like okay, now you're kind of weighing between like, is it is it, it what, what is the what's the phrase? Uh, a bird in the hand is safer than two in a bush or whatever. It, mm -hmm. I can't remember the, the the concept is, but you know, when when you're applying for like uh, capital, like when you're investing in capital markets, you're you're investing and investment bears some sort of risk. And if you have right. sound money, technically the sound money should be as long as you have it on your person the amount of risk that you're exposed to is you uh, on your person losing it or wherever you stored it, potentially losing it. Whereas with like an investment in a capital market, if I bought a machine that could produce X amount of widgets versus just storing the widgets at my my house, like there's obviously risk that I might need to maintain that widget or or maintain that machine or that that mach machine might break down or, or something like that. So I don't know. It's it's like I, I money should be, and that's why I have an issue with it, Money should be a store of value. Like that's why it's so amazing. What an amazing discovery that instead of us having to figure out the ratio of chickens to apples, like we're like, well, let's just have this third party thing that can store value that is easy to transport and that doesn't necessarily go away uh, and that is universally recognized and valuable. Like that's that's awesome. That's what gold is, right? Uh, and by every metric, like money should be that way. Or if, if we're deter determining what is money, it should have those types of things and and be less of a risk than a capital market. But as you're saying, like, and you and I probably think very much the same way, like I actually prefer capital investments. Like I like buying assets that produce things, but it is risky, right? So yeah. I guess, and so it's therefore not safer. I see. Uh, so I, I, I think I misunderstood hit the latter point of his, because he he's actually saying the opposite, right? He's, he's criticizing Bitcoin because he's saying the idea that storing it in a fixed money supply isn't just naturally and objectively better than these income bearing assets. And I, yeah, so so I guess I would agree with him in that, uh, in the sense that is it just obviously better? Well, it depends on what your values are, and you know, yeah. value is subjective. <laughs> so I don't know that you're you can absolutely claim one or the other. But like the well, advantage is safer, right? Like that's that's kind of the oh the a safer store. Oh yeah, yeah. Then no, I I would say that uh, in a fixed supply money, I actually no. Then I then I do think I disagree with him because I think that the benefits of a fixed money supply are that it's more safe. Uh, relatively speaking, assuming you don't have, uh, it, you know, again, I guess that's, it depends on what his point in the broader context is, because he doesn't really d d define why. But if his argument is that because governments can regulate, because the money supply can be manipulated by, you know, if the government came in and did stuff, or, or then I would understand maybe his point. But on the merits, the the, the asset generating, or the, the value generating asset that he's talking about, the the income bearing assets, um, those, the value of those can shift in a day. Like for instance, him saying that, oh no, it would be much smarter to invest in the buggy whip, uh, you know, manufacturer building yeah. better than, than gold bars. Well, clearly the day that the car became mainstream, that was a completely wrong assessment. And all of those assets, while they still have some level of value, there's still some use. It's the value of that is going to decrease relative to what your gold supply is. So I would, I would, I don't think it's a safer bet by any means. Um, again, unless his argument is that in the specific case of something like Bitcoin, um, it is prone to a government that wants to come in and uh, decimate it or the fact that other people won't adopt it. I guess the question is, is he talking in theory, in reality or whatnot? But I, I think that it generally speaking, um, I mean, look at the housing market crash like that. Is that, you know, uh, was that a safe bet at that time? I, I, I don't know that I can agree with this take. Um, actually, it I think there's very few situations where I would agree with it now that I now that I have processed this and realized, yeah, no, I don't I don't I don't think this is a good take at all.
It, it's a funny one, man. Like when I first saw it, like I, I had the same thing as you. I was like, oh, like I think I agree with this. And then like as I thought about it more, I'm like, oh, I agree with this in the way that I live my life under the current system that I disagree with, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because like the only way it, he, he is correct with our current rate of how we print money, it actually is safer or less risky to speculate on the market because at least with that, you might have some upside. You only have downside when you store money today. But what, what got me was that money should. And I think he's really trying to go after like the sound money folks, because when I was kind of looking through the comments, like there were sound money folks chiming in and he was kind of like going at them again about all this stuff. I'm like, well, okay. Like in the, in the ideal world where money, where what we define money as something that is, uh, you know, fixed and not assigned, uh, not, not able to be printed and like manipulated. And we don't have the, the modern monetary policy or anything like that uh like then then it then i am like totally disagree with this take and so i guess it depends on how you evaluate it you know it's it's funny uh i'm sure like on instagram you see like a lot of these like finance bros and stuff like talking about like oh you need to get assets and you know once you get an asset then it's easier to get another asset or whatever and it's like it's like okay like that's like such a weird way to like look at the world and they they talk about it like it's um like practical timeless advice mm -hmm. and like it is timeless advice within the past you know 120 years you know before the federal reserve came out but before that it was much better and more agile to actually have your value stored in money because then you could use it when you wanted to on what you wanted to use it for the fact right. that a house that you build today or not even that you built, but a house that you built in 1970 with outdated materials in a less efficient manner that is laid out not as great, does not have as much, uh, you know, curb appeal is worth, you know, 30x what it was worth in 1970 when it was built. It's kind of a weird thing. We don't have that in any other type of like asset or anything like that, other than like stuff like the stock market and things like that, right? And the stock market is even a little bit more correlated, but the housing market is the best example of like where speculation and uh, money printing has like destroyed just the ability of the society to actually progress in a way uh, where people have more uh, and, and their money is worth more and their savings are worth more. Uh, because every day that you work, like the stuff that you work for is actually worth less uh, because they're printing so much money. And uh, in, a, in a normal society where we do have sound money, though, like it would be better to have the, uh, the, the, the money on hand because then you can spend it on what you actually want. Uh, and it's not the only risk you have is, is it being actually taken away from you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Yeah. So, so I think the, I think the way that this take maybe works is if he's saying, look at the real world we live in right now. And as it stands with, you know, federal reserve intervention and government intervention, the idea that a fixed supply of like Bitcoin um, is inherently safer is ridiculous. Under that, I could I could understand the argument. We might go back and forth because again, I still think that you know, just speaking about assets broadly is that that's just kind of like you can pick and choose which ones do and don't benefit you. You know, the moment we have a housing crash, you can say, "Well, I meant other assets." You know, and it's like, well, but that's the trick, isn't it? Right. The safer thing is to have something that isn't prone to that kind of subjective crash. Again, if you're arguing that's Bitcoin in the current status quo, maybe not because you have seen. Bitcoin is almost more like a stock than it is a currency in the in the way that it's being used and handled. Um, so I, I think I think part of the the trick here is, and maybe he's not trying to trick. Maybe he's addressing a very specific point that he's come across with people speaking that I'm just not privy to with the context. But it seems like he's kind of taking the uh, the theoretical arguments of people who say here's why Bitcoin should be adopted and here's why Bitcoin is a good thing. And then applying the real world standard in the same way that, for instance, I, I might say, well, it's ridiculous the idea that the police can come in, knock down your door, invade your house. Uh, we shouldn't have that. And then, you know, in, in the, the practical real world where you're, you, you know, the, you know the, the government's letting in a bunch of foreign people, letting criminals on the streets, and then you call 911 he's saying, oh, look, this guy who doesn't like what the police is doing or calling them now, you're taking the, the hypothetical sort of platonic ideal talking about in theory when we're what we what we should be striving towards and what is right or wrong versus the real world the situation that can contextually change um and obviously you work your way towards that that ideal um and so that's to maybe maybe the 
maybe the angle that he's kind of going yeah. from, I'm not sure. What, what's hard for me, like, I guess as the more I w- look at this take, the more I understand it, um, which hopefully that would be the case. Uh, <laughs> but like, I, I am I am arguing for sound money, but I'm not arguing for Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, he's arguing against Bitcoin. So he and I are on the same page there. And I think his evaluation of Bitcoin as like sound money is is correct. Like Bitcoin money is supposed to be a, a store of value that is universally accepted and can change forms over time. It's easy to like transport and things like that. And uh, does not like wilt away or rot or anything like that. That's why gold is so awesome and has commonly been accepted as money, as real money, because one, it you can be changed forms, like you can melt it down, it doesn't go away. Uh, it's quantifiable and it's a good store of value over time. Like it never, like I was saying, it never rots away or anything like that. Uh, Bitcoin, like to me, doesn't have any desirability other than like, oh, it's a currency. Like it's saying a currency is a currency or it's circular definition. And so that's why I don't really like it. I mean, I guess it's tied to energy. It's like if you let your car run for a bunch of hours and it spit out tokens, that's like what that is. But it's like, well, they're not really, you can't get the energy that the Bitcoin consumed. So that's why it doesn't make any sense to me. So I agree with him on that point, but he's criticizing sound money in general. It's like, well, no, Bitcoin just isn't sound money. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you know, the Bitcoin arguments would have to do with uh, the the unique identifiers, the fact that it's not replicable, the fact that yeah. it is transferable instantaneously, things like that, that, that do provide value. The fact you don't have to run through like a bank or and stuff like that. Yeah. So I would say that there are values to it. Um, but, but I agree. I also think that the way that it's being viewed by many people doesn't help in the same way that, um, you but know, people like don't China- use it that way. Yeah. You know, right. That's why no, it's a problem. People use yeah. it as an investment, which is what, oh, exactly. why, yeah, 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 yeah. The way that it is applied is not being used for the value that I think it does provide. It's kind of yeah. like NFTs, where NFTs, the way that the culture jumped onto them, so, so, so stupid. The actual value proposition it had was actually really, really good and cool, and I hope they make a comeback, but not... It's like the brand of NFT has just been so tainted by the morons who ran away with making things like, oh, look at this picture. And it's like, that's not... You know, it's like the, the NFT technology had a lot of really cool stuff about like tracking things, like the idea, of, like if you bought a digital game, you could track that with an NFT in a way that you could then sell that game to someone else and they would have that copy. You wouldn't be able to access it. It wouldn't be di- digital replication in that way. There, there were a lot of really great uh, values. That's not how it got used. And so, yep. <laughs> again, that's maybe part of his critique here where he's like, he's critiquing the idea of sound money and then applying the the imperfect reality of what is not the theoretical idea of sound money yeah. um so it, it you know it'd be like saying okay uh all philosophy or the, the benevolent dictator actually sucks benevolent dictators are terrible look at joe biden and it's like okay well he's he's no benevolent dictator you know that's not that's not a good standard to apply to the idea if you're going to critique benevolent dictators you can't point to a real world example and say that is a benevolent dictator when it's clearly yes yeah all right, moving on to our next one. Uh, we've got the feminist turned housewife on X. I shouldn't say Twitter anymore. And she posts, being a stay-at-home wife and mother is the most important and hardest job any woman could ever have. What do you think? Uh, I will say it's the most important. I don't know that you can necessarily say it's the hardest job yeah. any woman could have. I don't know this account, but I here's what I will say. Obviously we are very pro traditional values here. And we, I a hundred percent celebrate women who are able to stay at home, who can spend time with their children. That should be um, glorified really in in the community. I think that it is the most important job women have. It is their unique ability that men simply cannot do in the same way. It is just a, a biological reality that men do not have the same ability that women do to that does it doesn't mean that men can't in this case you know it's like if if you have to be a, a, a dad that takes care of kids because your wife passed away or something or or if just that the economic realities are like you get laid off and your wife has to work and you're while you're looking for like i i get it that men can serve in that role but it is not the same and it's not as effective and so it is the most important job for a woman absolutely i'm also wary of the online cosplaying role-playing traditional wife movement that we've seen and i don't know if this person is doing that but it looks like it and i think that the you know i think that there's something to be said for i don't don't know dressing modestly and 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 not you know putting yourself out in in a way that's um sort of gaudy or or attention-seeking but i would argue that the people who dress 
like it's the 1800s or the early 1900s and say, I'm a trad wife. They're doing the same thing, but just with a different time period. They are doing it for the attention. They're doing it for the looks. Yep. And they're cosplaying this week, not because they actually believe in the values. They they almost do it as a way to get attention or or buy into an ideology beyond the purpose of what that ideology serves. The only reason why you should have an ideology uh, is because you think that it's true and that it works. And it feels like to me that the the the, the housewife online, um, I don't know, like movement is fueled by people who want more to be heard than to actually live out their ideal. Because frankly, if they really believed what they said about this, the traditional housewife probably wouldn't be on Twitter posting. <laughs> yes, that's a very fair point. Yeah, I, I in, in general... In spirit, like this take, I also share the same caveat as you that, you know, the hardest job. Uh, I, I think a better way to put it would be this is the most consequential like, yeah, role that's that a any great woman would have. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, there, it's hard is such a weird way to, to put it. Because it's like, if you worked at a job, if you worked at a job that you absolutely, totally loved, every single aspect of it. Like you laid awake at night thinking about what you're going to go do when you you know woke up to go to work and everything like that. And then after you left, you were daydreaming about going back. Like I, it would be hard to describe that job as the hardest, right? Yeah. Like, and, and, I, and for many mothers, the best mothers out there, like they think about their children all the time. They cannot wait to, to be with their children, to hang out with them, to raise them, to love on them and all those things. And so, you know, I, I could say that like, as a dad, like, yeah, it's like materially very, very difficult. I don't know if it's like the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. But it's it's not the hardest because it's also the most rewarding, right? And and I'm sure for some women in certain circumstances, it can be very difficult. But, you know, this point, regardless, though, I think is important. And like you're saying, these uh, these people that kind of grift off of it um, for the attention. And I, I, I was thinking at the same point, it's like, yeah, if you, if you really do believe this, then like you don't have no time to be you know, she's got uh, 28.5 thousand posts on Twitter. It's like, yeah, you don't have time to be making those, you know, if you really if you really are living this this philosophy out. Um, so it but it is the most important role. And I, I think that we've kind of had the, the danger of like culture in general is to have overcorrections either way. And uh, because for a long time, you know, maybe uh, women and motherhood was maybe not as honored as it should have been like we've overcorrected one way and now we're kind of overcorrecting in a different way which is to be like oh like it's the only dimension and aspect of a woman's character that matters it's like no like that's not it's not entirely true it's like i was saying it's the most consequential and if you fail at that then yeah like you are if you're not a good uh wife and you're not a good mom to you know if you have children to your children then yeah like nothing else in your life matters but that doesn't mean that like if you are those things that the other things don't matter like they do right. uh, and they, they you are more than just that uh but that doesn't mean that you know that you should only care about those other things yeah yeah agreed well and, and i mean i i also agree that the 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 definition of hardest is so nebulous in the sense that there are times when and I think you'll experience it uh, more and more as as your kid gets older. In particular, when the the moral decisions you make or the advice you give is really tricky and difficult to navigate because that is life and that is difficult to navigate. But like you said, the impacts are more consequential, right? Because you're shaping a human and how they perceive the world and and experience. So I would say that that's also true for fathers. Um, and I think that that may be. I wouldn't say it necessarily contradicts this narrative, but I think it it, it presents an annoying thing for the for the traditional <laughs> online housewife to to say that. Oh yeah, well also like being a father is the most consequential job that that they can have too. Like men men are called to to different work than women for sure, but also like being a father and raising the next generation of humans that's also the most consequential thing that they're going to do. And just parenting in general is going to be the most consequential thing that parents do. Uh, because that literally outlives them. A business yeah. might outlive them for some time, but you know, kids will, uh, you know, awful tragedy aside, uh, will outlive them generations and generations. So it's not just about you know. I, I think sometimes they they also the the, the online um, role playing 
<laughs> crowd will have this idea that it's like it's the it is solely the domain of women to housekeep and take care and it's like no look at look at history beyond like the 1950s you know go a little bit further back and recognize that parenting bringing children up and even contributing to the to the work of the house that was that was the household's responsibilities the both of the parents pitched in women worked from the home men worked around the home uh kids worked at the home as well everyone was responsible to bring something to the table and parents were equally involved in the upbringing and it's not just like oh that's the women's domain that's women's work that's a that's a really condescending dismissive and again very role play of the 1950s level understanding of what family is and i think that you have to look at a much broader picture i i remember actually reading a book uh homeschooling we we always laughed at this growing up because there was some book it was like a historic fiction book about a family that would grew up in in rural America, and I think that some some people had moved into a, an area that was more rural and like moving out west or something. And there was a guy, like an older gentleman, who was helping the family get settled and guide. And he gave one of the kids a pet. I think it was a pet, like a, like a cow, like a like a calf or something. And his advice was, um, every member of the household should have one pet that they're responsible for and useful for eat and, and that is useful the animal itself should be useful that way you have the responsibility of caring for something and that thing also contributes to the well-being of the household so you're you're getting this from the, we we as a household died laughing because at the time we had just gotten one miniature dachshund and uh and so my mom laughed we've got four humans looking after one very unuseful dog yeah what did um, he contribute <laughs> yeah quite quite nothing quite literally nothing maybe uh urine in the backyard to keep the moles away maybe <laughs> if, we're, mm. if we're being generous but but anyway regardless that that to me is a much healthier perspective of the sense that like everyone in a household is responsible to each other even the kids to some degree um but it's not like this 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 passive thing like oh the woman's domain is inside the house. The man's domain is anywhere outside of that. And the kids are entirely under her purview. And that's just where I see this trend going. And so people who post things like this, oftentimes it's so much more attention seeking and shallow. So maybe I'm projecting a lot more onto this take. I think I've probably taken it into ways that with well, a lot more than this particular person said. So I apologize to this person if this is not the perspective. They could be perfectly uh, fine. But I, I just see this trend and kind of wanted to address that more just because there are takes like this that I see constantly that are way more attention seeking and grabby than this one particularly is, but could be leading to. Yeah, I agree. What's that gal's name? Pearl, whatever. Like oh, she's just, she's just the worst. She, is she, she does more to set back women than, you know, even some of the feminists oh, do. Man, I was vaguely aware of her until recently. I watched, oh, um, the, she's the worst, a video from uh Trent Horn actually on her and he Pearl Davis. Her. That's, her, yeah. that's her name. Yeah, yeah. man. If anyone wants a, <laughs> a an exercise in like sadism, go watch that. And <laughs> okay. Oh man, it's just like doing. It's like if there's controlled opposition on like healthy families, like she is that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andrew Tate and her on one side, and then all the feminists and egalitarians on the other. It's yeah, like, yeah. She is a female Andrew Tate. That's a <laughs> that's a good good uh good relation there. All right, uh, our next one. We've got Elon Musk and someone reposting it. Uh, Elon Musk writes, There are two modern examples, Germany and Korea, where people were essentially in the same starting position, but the country got split along an arbitrary line. One side went full government, communism, and the other side went about half government. A few decades later, the standard of living in the fully government side was roughly five times lower. This gap widened further with time. It's a good test of which system is better. Uh, uh, sorry, a good test of which system is better is who needs to build a wall to keep people in. That's the bad one. Uh, and someone reposted this saying, this is a child's understanding of history. What do you think? Did Elon Musk get it right? Or is he, he got a child's understanding of, of Germany and, and Korea? So, man, I have a lot to say on this one. First of all, this person, I looked them up just because I was curious. They are unhealthily obsessed with Elon Musk. I think two out of three posts they make is just some sort of trying to dunk on elon musk uh in his, in his bio he's got like communist so let's talk about a child's understanding of the world when you're actively saying you're a communist and you don't want to acknowledge the real world examples of communism and their detrimental horrific awful effects on on humankind um and here's the thing so on the one hand uh is this a simplistic understanding of the of the situations? In a sense, 
Yes, it's it's a summary. It's a an overview. It is not every single thing with every single factor that needs. But also, it is a correct understanding. It is also, it, it, yeah, take shortcuts. Be, but like you could all say that about every single descriptive. Like like ask this person what happened in the Civil War, and I'm sure they'll tell you, oh, it was fought over slavery. And even even a more nuanced take of saying it was fought over, you know, slaves' rights or or excuse me, states' rights. Um, that would also be a, a a child's view in a sense that it would also be a simplistic. Then you'd have to say, well, it was specifically fought over um, a lot of the the growing frustrations from Southern farmers and, and the economies that were. Dr it's like you can keep getting more into the nitty gritty and nitty gritty, and you can always demand that more. This is actually a fairly good general understanding you can make. This also is one of those things where it's sort of a praxeological assessment of what happened, where it's like, um, can you, you know, can you control for every single factor to see that it was just communism versus capitalism and that's why those things went good or bad? It's like, no, you can also just know some things because you know those things. Like you can reasonably infer that when you have two societies in in the modern world with two major cases uh, of free economies and not the free economies always grow and are produce better results. Communist China, for instance, th the more free it's made its markets, generally the more free the people have been. They're not free by any means. They are still closed and controlled, but they had to open their markets because they were literally running out of money. And that necessarily afforded their people more freedoms. It's not perfect. It's not good. There are bad trends. But when you see this pattern repeatedly, you can kind of surmise that this quote unquote child's understanding of history is just a simplistic understanding of reality in certain ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you've totally like eviscerated in a good way. It's, it's the equivalent of, uh, of, you know, if you, you ask a child, like, well, how does a car work? It's like, well, you put the key in, turn it on and it works. It's like, you're not wrong. Right. With that. And just because they didn't go describe, you know, how a combustion engine, you know, works and the capacitor draws electricity and stores it here and then fires here and there. Like, yeah, that just, just because you don't describe those things doesn't mean that they got it wrong. And Elon Musk is even a little bit more deep than than just the turning the car on. Like he actually provides which countries they are and absolutely and, and why, uh, you know, actual like five times lower. And I don't know whether that's a true statistic or not. But I mean, I think everyone can understand and realize like my parents went to uh, West Germany. Um, and, and saw the wall back before it was torn down. And they're like, yeah, it was crazy. Like we talked to people that had escaped and just how bad it was on each side. And uh, I mean, modern day today, we can look at North and South Korea and, and how that all pans out. So it's the evidence before our very eyes. And a child's understanding is to see something and then be like, well, no, that's wrong because it doesn't fit the narrative that I desire. And that's what this person has. So they actually have a child's understanding of history because they they make it fit whatever their you know whim of their uh of, of their their brains is at, at the moment um you know what's funny you you were talking about china and it was a little bit more interesting to me i think than than some of this but like like people talk about china like it's communist and everything and how they had to open up uh you know trade and everything and they've they've kind of been in a boom and it's like yeah like they're communist because they require like a government party official to be on the board of every yeah of every company that they've got and then you think about the United States and it's like, it's like, yeah, you don't necessarily require a government official to be on the board, but the government reserves the right to like intimidate and bully everyone that's on the board of those places to the point where they basically are on the board of every company that that is large. And so it's just like, yeah, like it's not that much different. Right. And like you look at the prosperity that comes about, like I can't remember the um, the, the guest on Tom Woods. He's, he's an Irish guy and he writes about capitalism a lot and he's very good at it. Uh, but he basically talks about like how capitalism and free markets succeed in spite of uh, governments trying to crush them, right? In spite of all of this uh, friction that they throw up and barriers that they throw up, uh, it still succeeds. And you see that both in China and in the United States. Uh, the examples of, of East Germany and North Korea are examples where there was completely no free enterprise at all. Uh, but you can see with China, even with just a little bit of free enterprise in the United States, where we had a little bit more free enterprise, just just how much prosperity it does grant. Yeah, absolutely right. All right. Um, our next one is a video. It's Jordan Peterson. And I'm going to play it here. 
say that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. now, sure. But right now we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed saying the car hasn't hit me yet. So I don't think there's any coming. Jordan is obviously, let's say, suspect about climate oh, change, just... the arguments behind climate change wow. and the uh, the policies that the people pushing the climate change agenda actually have. Take a look. The, I'm talking about the record temperatures that are declared that have been declared for like the past five years that have also increased with the uh, with the concentration of parts per million of carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. Um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. now, sure. But right now, we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed, saying the car hasn't hit me yet. So I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I think know. that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas. And then as and then right, and then you have to correct, then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas. And then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data, this is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're gonna save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. Okay. Okay. So that I I cut the clip, but I think I uploaded the full one by accident there. But regardless, yeah, that's the that's the take. And what a what a great evisceration from from Jordan Peterson. One of my one of the things that I appreciate about this is not only does he just undermine the credibility of the specific data that's being presented as fact. I think that the 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 most poignant part to me, the most <sighs> elucidating thing is that he's saying oh we're gonna save the poor in the future by sac and then by sacrificing the poor of today and then highlighting how every single regime that has committed atrocities against their own people use that exact justification that it's always for the future in the future and and they they put people on the altar of the future basically and one of the radically amazing things about free markets is that we have through free markets and through free exchange, been able to actually lift the people up today while providing the biggest in, the biggest changes forward for the future. You get best, the best of both worlds. Rather than having the central planners to say, we're going to make the future uh, in, in the way that we want, and we're going to sacrifice people to get there along the way, free markets through free exchange say, hey, guess what? We're going to lift up the people around us who are in poverty by pr by producing things that make their lives better, that make better things affordable for them, and in doing so, they naturally get you naturally get the benefits of a brighter future and of those leaps forward. And so it's a win win there. And so anytime you see a movement, and it does not matter what the movement is based in, and that's one of the pernicious things about the climate agenda is that it doesn't purport to do things. Uh, as an economic system, it's not like they're saying, "Oh, we're the Marxists or we're the um, uh, we're this branch of school of, of economists or whatever." They're just saying, "No, no, no. This is just this has nothing to do with economics. It it has to do with saving the planet, for being green, for being environmental." And that's the problem with it is that then people th disassociate their minds from, "Oh, this isn't an economic thing. This is an existential thing." But in reality, it all loops back. To again, any regime that is trying to tell you that in order for the future, you have to cut sacrifice um, and, and basically massacre uh, people in the present day, uh, it's always a ploy for control and it's always undergirded by really, really faulty ideology. Yes. Yeah, that is that's so good. And, you know, Jordan Peterson, when he's on, man, he's he is so on and so good. Uh his his beginning statement about you know uh, the climate change models and how kind of 
they're not really actually models or data. Their their guesswork is really good. You know, people will. Uh, I, I had this conversation with my wife. Uh, like in a business, like you can make the data say whatever you want. As if you start with like an objective and or an outcome or a, a, a like a theory that you want to prove. Like it's very easy to manipulate business data and any sort of data. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be business to to make it turn out the way that you want. And then not only that, but if you figure out how to present it and everything, like it's it's kind of all game over from there. And uh, I was remembering uh, uh, this person I used to work with. Uh, they uh, we we were watching. Um, he was privy to some like extra board meetings and stuff at a, at a large company. And he was like, "Yeah, they would try and give their forecast uh, about where they were planning for revenue and things like that." And he's like, "The people that would succeed and get ahead." were the ones that would promise the world. Like they would just say like, oh, we're going to 300x, you know, our revenue and and all this stuff. And when they asked like how confident they were about achieving that, they'd be like, I don't know how confident, but that's like what the board wants to hear is yeah. me to say that. Um, whereas like a realistic manager that had some modest proposal for growth, you know, was never going to be promoted because they were viewed as like sandbagging or doing something like that. And the fact of the matter is, is that like all the incentives for the climate change, like you were talking about, uh, they are incentivized to make it and extrapolate it and make it look as bad as it possibly can. But there's no possible way for them to actually have an accurate forecast of where things are going to be because there's so many variables and the, so many of those variables are spread out over such a large uh, period of time that any minor error, even if it's you know to the millionth of an error, if you spread that over, let's just say 600 variables over a hundred year, 200, 300 year period of time, like it's a very big difference in how things are uh, actually affected. And not only that, uh, let's just say you knew all the variables, but we don't. Uh, you now have to also account for variables that we don't know, like some jump in technology or some sort of catastrophic earthly event that changes how things are done. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, we run out of some sort of resource, we discover some sort of new resource, like there's no way to actually project these types of things uh, accurately. And, you know, one of my favorite types of posts that I see routinely on the climate agenda is, is when people post like Al Gore uh, predicting, you know, when the polar ice caps are going to melt, and then, you know, the date arrives. And I think this date was actually now like two decades ago, uh, and the polar ice caps are still there. And, you know, we're gonna have acid rain by 2010, and all these different types of things. And it's like, yeah, those things came and went. And that's not to say that those might not happen in the future, but I, one thing I know for certain is that you can't predict when they're going to happen. Yeah, and, and another example of that, even less sort of disastrous, is just the the, the unintended consequences uh, that people prescribe when they're saying, "Well, we we just need to make these moves so that we can avoid the potential of those things." It's like that that incurs very real cost. And let's let's talk about an example that's maybe less draconian than some others that actually actively hurts low income people more. So one of the things that Washington is doing in its absolute brilliance is requiring um, all vehicles to be electric by 2040. That is the, or at least new vehicles sold in the state. And so obviously what this means, the 2040 uh, or 2030. Uh, oh, maybe it's 2030. 30. It might be 2030. There's different... 2040 is maybe ST3 or something. I don't, there's so many stupid targets in, in Washington on different years. Yeah, 2030. But even 2040 would still be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. both are bad. Um, now, let's get the, the electric power grid aside. Because that's... I've, I think I've talked about that. And a lot of people are aware of that particular aspect. How you increase the number of electric vehicles. You have an unsustainable amount of electricity being used. We're going to encourage rolling blackouts and brownouts. A aside from that, let's talk about how having more people forced into buying electric vehicles actually actively disproportionately hurts poor people. Let's pretend for a minute that even if you were low income, you were allowed to still buy uh, a gasoline car in the state. How would that negatively affect you? Other people's choices, but they're still... A Here's how. Electric vehicles are much heavier than traditional gas and diesel vehicles. They uh, a, a, an average sedan car is, I think, at least is like two to three times heavier. It can, can be um, if it's an electric vehicle than than a, a non. I don't remember the exact, but it is substantially heavier. What this means is that roads that were designed for vehicles of a certain weight now wear down exponentially faster because you have vehicles that are 
multitudes higher than they were anticipating and that they were designed for driving over them in increasing numbers. This means that road conditions are now extremely worn out and are much, much worse a lot quicker than they were before. Also, this means that the shift of the tax revenue has, to, even if, if your you know ideal system includes a government with social programs, you now have an increased amount of burden that goes towards fixing roads uh, rather than take, putting into other social programs. Uh, roads that have that are in poor condition, that have potholes, those damage vehicles. People who are on lower incomes have less money and resources to spend on repairing their vehicles, and when they don't have access to a vehicle, are disproportionately negative, negatively affected because they are usually only going to be able to have one, uh, and so therefore that is their main mode of transportation out. They also are less likely to have jobs that allow them flexibility to work from home, and so you have a, just a cascading multitude of effects where just this one policy that's like, look, it's not a bad thing to get carbon out of the atmosphere. We're just trying to incentivize people to use electric cars, which are green, renewable energy. Not even talking about the energy that they use and how that disproportionately impacts lower income people. Just the road wear alone causes a chain reaction and just a wave of negative impacts that makes life hard for the poorest people instead of the reverse where free markets and, and free exchange have made things more accessible to them than ever before. Yeah. What people also forget to realize, and this is one of the variables that they're not factoring in when they make their models and their forecasts, is that there's actually a natural incentive for companies and entities and household owner or house uh, homeowners and people that own vehicles and stuff to become more carbon neutral, right? Because it's it's less expensive. The key factor being that it actually whatever solution does come about is actually less expensive overall and beneficial, right? And that's the beauty of the free market is that. It actually leads to solutions that work. When you have a government that mandates certain types of solutions, it means that that solution has to be adopted and expense and price and cost has to be expended upon that, regardless of whether it actually is efficient and beneficial. Uh, and you can't actually know whether it is for usually a long time after uh, on a macro scale. But on the micro scale, people are able to figure that out on their own because they're going to make decisions and act in ways that actually benefit them. You know, uh, I've talked about this example many times on here, but when when I worked in in HVAC, like the city of Seattle passed a, a building uh, um, like retrofit and energy efficiency code, where they basically would fine building owners if at a certain type of uh, 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 like period of time, if they if they didn't at these iterations like make changes to the buildings that made them more efficient, and they had to have someone come through and do an audit. It cost twenty five cents a square foot, and Basically, I, I showed up to this meeting and these these city planners and everything uh, were rolling this out and super excited about it. And all the guys that showed up to this meeting uh, about you know building sustainability and things like that, they were enraged because they're like, you guys are literally penalizing all of us who have already done these. We're proactive in making these changes because we made these changes last year. We spent all this money, one building owner uh, that manages a really large uh, nonprofit uh, that we that we would all be familiar with was like, Hey, like we literally spent tens of millions of dollars on making all of our commercial storefronts like energy efficient. And because we have, I think they had like seven stores in downtown Seattle in the surrounding area. Like you're going to make us literally pay to audit and get feedback that like we already did stuff that was good for it. Uh, and you're penalizing everyone that already did stuff. And so it's like all that resources, right. That, uh, that they could have been using to further increase their sustainability. And we're now going to go towards compliance and, that's generally how these things go. And so uh, another additional factor and variable that people should factor into their, their climate forecast is uh, burdensome regulation that you know stalls actual helpful innovation. And uh, that's kind of the story of, of government and the private sector in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely right. Cool. Uh, well, if you don't have any more, I'm, I'm good. All right. Well, awesome. Let's wrap it. All right, friends. Thanks so much for hanging out. We really appreciate it. And we'll catch you on the next one.